Hello, and welcome to this evening's virtual event with Brookline Booksmith featuring Hank Philippi Ryan launching her newest thriller, Her Perfect Life, along with an absolutely fantastic gallery of thriller and mystery and suspense writers, all emceed by the wonderful Jenna Blum. My name is Alex Schaffner, and I'm the events director at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. If you're familiar with our store, welcome back. If this is the first time you're ever hearing about us, welcome. We're really happy to have every single person who's here join as part of our community this evening. And we can't thank you enough for supporting Hank's work and for supporting an independent bookstore through your purchases and attendance. And I think Jenna is going to remind you this as well, but if you have not yet ordered a book from us, um, book sales will be open on Eventbrite until tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern. And any book that is purchased on that page will be signed and personalized by Hank. Um, tonight, I am thrilled to welcome Hank Philippi Ryan back to our stage. We've had the privilege and delight of hosting Hank's launches for years, and while we wish this could be taking place in the store itself, I think it's obvious from this huge audience um, that it couldn't be taking place in the store itself. It is so wonderful to see such a big and boisterous national audience coming out to support Hank. Um, and it's not going to be anything less of a party on screen. We've got guest appearances from Joe Finder, Wanda Morris, Hannah Mary McKinnon, Jennifer Hillier, and Samantha Downing. And as I said, Jenna Blum is here to MC the whole shebang. Now, I know you all know her well, but we can't start without a formal introduction of exactly how incredible tonight's author is. Hank Philippi Ryan is the USA Today bestselling author of 13 novels of suspense. She has won multiple prestigious awards for her crime fiction, including five Agathas, four Anthonys, and the coveted Mary Higgins Clark Award. She's also the on-air investigative reporter for Boston's WHDH-TV and has won 37 Emmys, 14 Edward R. Murrow Awards, and dozens of other honors for her groundbreaking journalism. National Book Reviews have called Hank a master at crafting suspenseful mysteries and a superb and gifted storyteller. Hank's novels have been named the best thrillers of the year by Library Journal, New York Post, BookBub, Pop, Sugar, Real Simple Magazine, and others. Her 2020 thriller is The First to Lie, which garnered a starred review from Publishers Weekly and was a nominee for the Anthony Award for Best Novel and the iconic Mary Higgins Clark Award. Her newest book, releasing tomorrow morning, is Her Perfect Life, a chilling psychological standalone novel about fame, family, and revenge. It has received starred reviews from Kirkus and from Publishers Weekly, which has rightly called it a superlative thriller. I can't wait to get things going, so without further ado, Hank Philippi Ryan and friends. Thank you. I, you know, you all, Jenna, I know you are the host, and I just have to say, I'm looking here, when I look this way, you all, I'm looking at the comments, and I really thought that I was going to get through tonight without crying, and I really fear that's not going to happen. You know, I see Tina de Bellegarde and Tracy Clark and Aline Cogdell and Melanie Borelli and Aaron Mitchell and Kathy Boone Real and Mindy Gabriel and Ron Block and Drew Ann and Carla and Lily and Laura Rossi. And I, if I read every name, uh, I see Edwin Hill, thank, thank you. William Martin is here. That is, you know, these people are new friends and old friends and my writer idols are here tonight and I am just so honored to see you all. So forgive me if from, from time to time I look over here because I am just Jim Ziskin and Joanne Love and Kimmer the Book Nerd and Robert Abbey and um, I'm just drinking in, here's Marissa and Henry Cohen and Mary Sutton just drinking in um, all of you and wishing I could see you in real life. And I know we will someday soon, but there are more than 200, almost 250 people here now. And you are making me cry. And I am unbelievably, incredibly grateful to Brookline Booksmith and Forge Books um, for making this all happen. And Jenna, I am so thrilled you are here tonight because I'm not sure I could do this on my own. I am just too happy. It's an honor to be here as your assistant and your obedient MC. <laughs> I also have been, I have never seen anything like this in my life and I've been to a lot of launches, but 
when the doors opened and everybody came in and said where they were from, where they, it was like fireworks going off. So many people, so many people here who love you and are so excited about her perfect life and to read your 13th book, um, me included, although I've already, I have read this people, um, <laughs> fantastic. Like Publishers Weekly got it right this time and so did Book oh. Giving and Kirk is giving star reviews. Um, so you all have a big treat in store. If you haven't yet read the book, you should purchase at least five copies right now which you can do from the event I think, and Hank will sign it for you. And also, those of you who have put your names and where you're from in the chat are now eligible for a giveaway of Her Perfect Life. And um, we will also be giving away the other mystery author guests books this evening. So um, anyway, we have a really exciting lineup of festivities planned and I'm just here to sort of keep the ball rolling and, and try not to talk too much but to entice other people to talk. I did want to give a quick shout out to the booksmith though because booksmith you are my jam. I have launched all of my books and I have like four instead of like 14 but like everybody here has about 8,000 books and I have like four books but um I've been a booksmith for every launch and they are fantastic. They are the superlative launch host and we are so grateful that you are giving us this platform to connect with readers and friends from literally all over the globe. It's so fantastic. Thank you. I mean, it's interesting because I see so many other authors here too tonight. Hallie Efren is here um, and Joanna Schaffhausen is here and Paula Mounier is here. And so many of my wonderful friends and authors have had their events at Brookline Booksmith as well. So it is just fantastic that everyone is here tonight. If I missed you, put your name in again, because I, I, I just fear missing people's names and I uh, embrace and love you all it is just um it's fantastic i'm gonna i'm gonna stop swooning about the names now go ahead and swoon. you you swoon i will ask questions so okay. the first thing that people will want to know always so the brand new book is what is her perfect life about so can you please give us your reader's digest condensed version of what the book is about yeah, it's really hard to talk about a psychological suspense thriller because you don't want to tell the plot and you don't really want to give it away. But there was something on Twitter once that said, can you can you tell about your book in five words? So I thought I would try that and I thought it would be easy, but it wasn't. But Her Perfect Life is about sisters, about betrayal, about guilt and fame and revenge. So bottom line about the book um, it stars a television reporter who has a deep, dark secret. It features a missing college student, and that is not the secret. It features an anonymous source, a passionate clandestine weekend in Aspen, and a little pink child's suitcase, actually a child's little pink suitcase, um, that is su suspiciously empty. So basically, it's a two strong women facing off in a high stakes cat and mouse game to prove their truth about a childhood betrayal. But which woman is the cat and which woman is the mouse? And that is her perfect life. Oh my God, that was an amazingly succinct description of your own book. I find that incredibly difficult to do and still can't tell people what my first book was about. And it came out 20 years ago. Um, so that was astonishing. And also I just, I'm going to say this and hopefully not give anything away, but there's sort of like an unreliable narrator producer, which as a producer myself, I love because you know we're all like secretly nefarious, like all of us, all of us producers, right? I am so. not going to say a word about nefarious producers. They are, <laughs> they are lovely and wonderful and helpful and they would do anything for you. And that is exactly what Greer would say about it's herself. In the it's book. fiction. The producer is fiction. Yeah, that is, that is totally true. That's right. So with, also without giving everything away and about this tasty like bouillabaisse of, of deception and betrayal and, and sisters and, and all sorts of juicy things you just fed us. What was the origin story? Because readers always want to know, myself included, what was the impetus for this book? You know, I've been a television reporter for 43 years, which is really crazy. And my, one of my first television jobs was in Atlanta. I was the um, weekend anchor for the CBS affiliate in Atlanta. And one Saturday night after having been on live on the news, I turned the corner driving home after midnight, way after midnight. I turned the corner onto Park Drive in front to see my house and it was surrounded by police cars with flashing blue lights. And I've been to enough crime scenes to know that you don't want to have police cars with flashing blue lights around your house. This is just not a good thing. So I, you know, I 
slammed into a parking space and leaped out of the car and ran up to the first police officer on the scene. And I said, I'm Hank Philippi Ryan from Channel 2. And he's like, I know who you are. And I said, okay, well, what happened? And he said, there was someone who broke into your house. There was a burglar in your house and he was caught. This was before the days of everybody having an alarm. So I guess the neighbors must have called. Um, they, he said, we, he, we caught him and he's in the backseat of that cruiser over there. And I said, well, what, why? And he said, he told us that he knew who you were and that he knew you were live on the air doing the news. So he knew you weren't home. He knew where I was because I was live. So he knew where I wasn't. And I started thinking about that as a television reporter and about anyone who's in the spotlight. Um, what People know you and they know where you are, so they know where you aren't. So when you're on live TV, when you're doing a live shot or anchoring the news, you are clearly there and anyone can turn on the television and see you. And that means you're not anywhere else. And also when you are live doing a live shot somewhere, um, people know where you are, they can come find you. And I've you know, done stories that do, you know, I've changed laws and changed lives and made a difference and gotten millions of dollars in refunds and restitution for consumers, but I've also made enemies. You know, every one of those enemies represents a secret that someone didn't want me to tell. And there are people who aren't happy about that. And they know where I am as well. So that's sort of the genesis of it, the dark side of the spotlight and how, like the main character, Lily Atwood, how can you keep a secret if you are always in the spotlight? And what if the spotlight is the most dangerous place of all? That is so fascinating. I, I have been sort of watching the chat while I was listening and everybody is saying, how creepy, creepy, how creepy. It's so creepy, it's creepy, it's creepy. I, you know, I'm sort of clutching my own face thinking about um, each Emmy of your 37 yeah. Emmys, and P.S. 37 Emmys people, 37 Emmys, but that is 37 people who didn't want you to say something. So yeah. I never thought about it that way. The book made me think a lot about um, the dark side of being on camera and the dark side of fame, which is some, a phrase that we throw around sort of glibly, but we think, oh, it must be such a privilege to have everybody know who you are and know your name and you have power and you have influence. And um, But there is also must be a feeling of being in a fishbowl all the time. Do you still experience that as both an award-winning author and a reporter? It's kind of an interesting balance. You know, when I started in television in Indianapolis in 1975, I will tell you, um, I was at the laundromat one day. That's how glamorous my life is. I was at the laundromat one day and some people, some, a woman came up to me at the laundromat years ago and said, oh, aren't you Hank? You know, I watch you on TV. Here's a story for you. I, here's my life story. Here's something I want you to do for me. And, you know, we, I ask for that. I want that. That's how I get stories is by saying, come up to me and talk to me and tell me things. But I thought I'm in the laundromat, you know, I'm in the laundromat. So, but I was, you know, you, you are kind and you're open and, you know, it might be the next Watergate that she's telling you. So you're going to listen. Um, but I went home and I called my mom and I said, you know, can you believe this woman came up to me in the laundromat and she's talking to me and my mom paused and she said, listen, sweetheart, you chose the spotlight. Welcome to the spotlight. And she said, and I never want to hear you complain again. And oh. I never have. I, I think that's a good lesson. And I think that's part of the deal. But one of the things I wanted to do in her perfect life was show that, you know, Lily, the main character, Lily chose the spotlight and that's fine. And she can deal with it and she accepts it for, for, for better or worse. And it's usually better. But her seven-year-old daughter, Rowan, did not accept the spotlight. Rowan didn't ask to have everybody looking at her and wondering about her and asking about her. And how do you protect your child in a situation like that? So it's not just about a quote, quote, famous person. It's about mothers and daughters and how we protect our families um, from whatever we have chosen as our career. How do we keep our children safe? So it's just as much a mother daughter story, a family story as it is a fame story. Right, because you wouldn't think about the collateral damage of fame uh -huh. being people you love also perhaps being at risk. It's just such a, I mean, it, it's such an amazing book for so many reasons. It definitely is something that will keep you 
pinned to your couch until you finish it. But it also raises a lot of other um, deeper issues. And, and that is one of the things that I loved about it. it has that weight and that gravitas to it. Like what is the price of fame, right? So now I no longer aspire to be famous. Thank you so much, <laughs> so much better. Life is much easier now. So I have one more question. I actually have many more questions and you know, I love Hank. I could talk to Hank uh -huh. all night about all the things. Um, but we also have 17 audience questions so far and we have a whole lineup of oh, no, we'll thriller authors. So my, my last question for you at the moment is, um, speaking of like choosing fame and choosing the spotlight, when you started out writing and you started out reporting, like maybe not knowing, you know, that there would be stalkers or people would know where you weren't and then therefore where you were, and now you are writing currently your 14th book. I mean, you're actually writing a book like, you know, while this is coming out, which is amazing. What would you tell your young self just starting out as that reporter in 1975 and also as an author embarking on this very distinguished career? And what would you tell her? I would tell her, she wouldn't believe me because she's still gonna be me, but I would tell her not to worry that we never know what's good or what's bad. We never know what to hope for. So, you know, my husband and I don't celebrate the anniversary of the day we met. We celebrate the anniversary of the day before we met. And we call it, you never know day because you never know what wonderful thing is around the next corner. So I think, you know, when we're disappointed or unhappy or upset, or we didn't get what we thought we always wanted, you never know what's about to happen. So I try to look at the world as like, yeah, well, that was funny. Let's see what that's supposed to mean. And then just sort of persevere and go forward with as much a sense of humor as we possibly can. I mean, I've got to say, look at all of us now on Zoom and our little boxes and these and wonderful people, Shannon Hansen and Vicky and Brenda in the chat. And we're all here. We're all doing it. Um, and who'd have thought we'd be able to pull this off? and manage it and still love each other and be caring about each other. So yeah, try not to worry, just see what happens. Right. That's say, good Jenna, I mean, that seems valuable, doesn't it? Oh, so I was just gonna say, it's such a valuable lesson to have, to carry through your life, but also has probably stood you in great stead during the pandemic when you never know what's gonna happen. You don't even know if your Zoom is gonna actually work. So there's that, but um, we have all proven to be remarkably resilient and to really need and crave connection and find ways to make that happen. I'm so grateful. All right, I'm gonna stop talking and start bringing up some of your fabulous guests. So Hank has invited like this ridiculous chorus line of star thriller authors to join us this evening. And her first guest is Hannah Mary McKinnon, um, who is Hannah Mary, like I asked her before when we were in the green room, how did she say her name? And Hannah Mary, I would love for you to turn on your camera and unmute yourself and join us. Hello, hello, and say your name because you have the most beautiful accent in the whole world. So when I say it, it sounds like Little House on the Prairie. But when you say it, it sounds fantastic. So. Um, Thank you, it's Hannah Mary McKinnon. Did I tell you, right? I'm like, it's <laughs> Hannah Mary McKinnon. I'm from New Jersey, like what am I, you know, that's, that's as good as it gets. So I'm gonna read everybody's bio as we bring them in to join the party. And this is, they're all very brief bios. But if you don't yet know Hannah Mary McKinnon, she was born in the UK, as you might have deduced, grew up in Switzerland and moved to Canada in 2010. Her suspense novels include The Neighbors and the bestsellers from Secret Son, Sister Dear, and You Will Remember Me. She said, I say that to people all the time, getting coffee. Um, and she now lives in Oakville, Ontario with her husband and three sons. And we are giving away a copy of You Will, You Will Remember Me. Um, and you should say it that way this evening. So welcome, Hannah Mary. And I'm going to hand you the, the mic and have a great conversation with Hank. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Um, lovely to see you. Lovely to see you, Hank. Congratulations. Thank you, darling one. It's so great to see you. I want the audience to know that I'm not giving away this particular copy. I'm keeping this one, but we will get you a pristine brand new one. I'm so pleased to see you. I'm so Good pleased night. to see you. you. The, the eve, you know, look, because this is the day before launch, which very often we have launches on the day of. So how, how, are you, how are you feeling the day, you know, twas the night before book launch? <laughs> how are you doing? I'm feeling great. I'm not one bit nervous. It's all good. <laughs> no, of course I'm nervous. I'm terrified. It's all, you know, I've done this for, this is my 13th time having a book launch and it never, it never gets any less joyous and it never gets any less 
terrifying. So I have to say with all these people saying hello, 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 Pamela and Barbara and Brenda and Lily and Sharon, so many of them we have met on First Chapter Fun. Yes, we have. One of the joys of the pandemic is that Hannah and I really, well, we talk each other, to each other every day now. Pretty much. Yeah. Because of First Chapter Fun. And we didn't know each other before the pandemic. We so, did not. No, that's the, that's the funny thing. And we, we met very briefly at BoucherCon, and we do have a photograph of it. That was in Dallas in well, two years ago. Can you believe it? It was two no, years ago. I can't believe it. Um, and then, and then it was through first chapter fun and, and, and here we are and it's your 13th book. And I'm so, so pleased and excited to be part of your launch. Thank you. Thank for you. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Me. I'm just going to say, I see Jane Cleland and Joe and Joan Lang and Anne Reed and Jay Collins. And, uh, just, I, I can't help but say people's names. We do this on first chapter fun every Tuesday and Thursday at 1230 PM ET, Hannah and I read you out loud. What can go wrong? The first chapter of a wonderful new book and I got to read you will remember me the first chapter out loud and that was quite a treat I, this is a this is a fantastic this is a fantastic book we write such different ways though I know that's that's the funny thing we, we have we have quite a lot of things in common I mean we're both workaholics and pretend that it's completely normal and we're not uh, and everything's fine um, we both have protagonists called Lily in this year's book but we have completely different ways of approaching our writing. So do you want to chat about how you approach writing books? Well, briefly, sure. I mean, it's kind of interesting because Hannah, I know that you are the supreme plotter. You know everything that's going to happen in the book. You have, she has note cards and sticky notes and not every lines and but... all those, pretty much. Um, and I know that you still let your book flow and evolve along the way and you're still surprised. I start with just a little idea of what might be a cool story and then I type chapter one and I think I say okay you know let's see what happens. Um, so every single thing that happens is a surprise to me. Um, I had no idea somebody asked me today if there was anything that was a surprise in um, her perfect life and I said, well, there are a few people who might be alive and might be dead. And I had no idea until it happened. And that's what sort of gets me to the computer every day is that I think, oh, I can't wait to see what's going to happen. And I won't know. I won't know until I find out. So when people say until I write it. So when people say, wow, the twist in her perfect life, you really got me. I'm like, yeah, wasn't that a surprise? Because I didn't I didn't know myself. And that's really part of the joy. See, that terrifies me. I would, uh, you say that motivates you to get to the computer and start typing. Me, wouldn't see me for dust. I'd be oh. running, 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 because I'll just, when I drive somewhere, I need a map or a GPS or so I need to know where I'm going. Um, and I love that. It's just, you know, the expression plotters and pantsers. Sure. Um, I think we decided, no, we, I plot before you plot on the page. I think mm -hmm. that's a more elegant way of Oh, well, that's a good idea because you do, I mean, I sort of go by what would someone really do? What does someone want and how far will they go to get it? So that's what I do on every page. What does somebody want? And often that's manipulating someone. So leave a comment. I'm going to find this book again. Leave your name, leave your, um, Katie is saying, I love plotting and Valerie saying, wouldn't see me for dust. I've never heard that expression, darling Hannah. And I have really? to say, we're, we're, no. we're all stealing it now. So don't forget to put your name in the chat, name and place in the chat um, for a copy of Hannah Mary McKinnon's wonderful You Will Remember Me. And your new book comes out next May and it's called? An Honest Man. All right. And we will be together for that as oh, well. Oh, for sure. Congratulations. Oh, okay. thank you, sweetheart. So, so nice to see you all the way from Toronto. <laughs> I feel as though perhaps an honest man is a bit of a misnomer somehow. I just I just have that feeling. I can't wait to see that. And I love hearing how different writers write because there is no right or wrong way. Um, now I'm going to bring on Joe Binder. So Joe, if you don't mind appearing on the stage. Hello. Hello. We are hello. Happy here. Hello. And I'm going to read for those of you who have been under a rock and don't know Joe, I will redo his bio. Joe Finder is the New York Times best-selling, award-winning author of 16 novels, slacker, including Paranoia and High Crimes, which both became major motion pictures. Welcome, welcome. 
Great to be here. Hank, congratulations. Oh, thank I, you. I think I told you earlier today, I think this is your best book. Oh, it's really fantastic. Thank you. And I got an email from Joe today, you all, um, congratulating me on the book. And you know, on crazy launch day, to get uh, an email like that, a complimentary, a super complimentary email from someone who, Joe, you were one of the first people, one of the first real people um, that I dared ask. And I was such a fan and still am such a fan. That's not a past tense, such a fan. But back then, um, I really, began to be in awe of you and you were so generous to read my book thank you it was oh, a great pleasure really mm -hmm. this one had me who, who said this pinned to the couch i was pinned to the couch <laughs> you did jenna you're totally right i was just yeah, pinned to the couch. and you're I in Chiburo, you're on the cape and yeah, I, remember, yeah. I remember when we were talking about house on fire before that came out yeah. um, and my book the, the the book before her perfect life um the first to lie we were talking about our plots before the books books came out and our log lines were exactly the same yeah. and the books are so different they're so different but we're sitting in the pe this wood-fired pizza place in in boston in back bay telling each other our log lines and we're like uh, yes, <laughs> uh and and your book came out first so i thought i'm doomed i'm uh -huh. so we're giving away a copy of joe finder's house on fire this fabulous fabulous thriller um, and so, it, hey, it's really quite something. I want to ask you, so you're really good with titles, I think. Your titles are very good. And I want to know, at what point did you have this title down? Oh, what a good question. Um, well, it's interesting because sometimes the titles come right away. The other woman was just the other woman. That, that's what that was going to be from moment one. Her perfect life. When I was thinking about the story, the perfect her perfect life. Uh, one of the one of the engines of the story was that an investigative reporter was getting anonymous calls from an anonymous source who was really good and was really giving her good stories. And then the the, the same person calls and starts telling her secrets about herself. And I thought, oh, you know, what would it be like to turn the tables on a reporter who generally is using someone else's secrets and seeking someone else's secrets right. um, to have someone say, now I know something about you. Now, yeah. how do you feel about it? And now what are you going to do? So I love the I love the conflict of that. So as a result of that, this book was initially called The Next Caller the next caller, mm -hmm. which I thought was nice and suspenseful. And my editor, my darling editor, Kristen Sevick says, sure, that, that's good, that'll work. And I thought, okay, I'm doomed. That's not gonna be the title. You know, this is Kristen being adorable, not gonna be the title. And it was when I was about halfway through the, through the book and I realized that that threat from the caller made Lily feel that she needed to protect her image that this in the book, and you'll see this off the bat, she is so perfect that her loving fans have given her a hashtag perfect Lily. She's hashtag perfect Lily. That's who she is to them. And what if he knows something or she knows something or whoever the source is knows something that's going to ruin that perfect life? And what would she do to protect it? And I thought, oh, her perfect life, her perfect life. Because, you know, yeah. that's it's cynical. You know, it's double meaning. I mean, nobody has a perfect life. And right, how... Right how silly it is to try to even pretend that you do. And I, I love the way you sort of bring us into their heads, the point of view, where we like the characters, all the main characters, I, I like them. Um, and I also was a little ambivalent about some of them at the same time. You know, I didn't dislike anybody, any of the main characters. Just like your real life though, right? Just like your real life. Yeah. So you're yeah. meeting new, and thank you for the compliment. You're meeting new people and you think, hmm, you know, I wonder what they want. I wonder what they really mean by that. Are you really being nice to me and helpful or do you have another agenda? And I think we, right. when we meet people in real life, that's how we behave to each other, right? We, you know, everybody wants something, like I was saying, and we, be, we behave to each other. We behave to people in different ways, depending on what we want, what our relationship is with them. And that's what I was trying to exactly thank you. What I'm trying to portray in her perfect life is yeah. that little mind games going on. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. really, really good. Well, don't forget to, no, don't you all don't forget to put 
um, your name and city or state. Um, Chris, Cynthia is saying her perfect life is a perfect title. Thank you. And everybody's wanting this book, Joe. Everybody's wanting House on Fire. So nice. thank you so much for being here tonight. It's um, really a joy. Thank you, Hank. And, and, so and best of luck and congratulations on thank a great you. launch. Thank you. I can't. I couldn't do it without you. You, my career would not have started without you. I can honestly say that. So thank you. Wow. Thank you. Okay, that sounds like a story that we would need to hear. That maybe you guys can go back and put in the chat, or we can ask during questions. And I'm supposed to be asking audience questions. I might be like, "Hi, I'm also the audience, and I need to hear that story." Um, <laughs> lots and lots of love for Joe, also in the chat. I have to say, a lot of fireworks exploding for Joe and for Hannah Mary and for First Chapter Fun. It's just a big love fest, and bringing a new writer into the love fest. Jennifer Hillier, come on down. We had a discussion in the green room about whether Jennifer is a Jennifer or a Jen or a Jen Jen. So now to me, Jen, Jen Jen Jensen. Jen Jen to Jen. Jen. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Um, let me read your bio really quickly, embarrass you. I should do this with everybody's cameras off. Jennifer Hillier, am I saying your last name right, please? Hillier, yeah, Hillier. Damn it, I was trying to be French, never worked. <laughs> Jennifer Hillier. Jen Jen, Jen Jen Hillier is the author of six novels, including Jar of Hearts, which is a fantastic name, which won the Thriller Award and Little Secrets, which was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize. She lives in a suburb just outside Toronto with her family and her latest book, Little Secrets. Hank, I think you have this, yes? Of course I do. I have yeah. several copies. <laughs> yes, she does. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank welcome you for Hank. having me. Congratulations, Hank. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, thank and you. I'm Try not to be starstruck with um, all the power you have in your lineup tonight. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm a fan you. of everybody here. So, um, Isn't it so I, interesting? It's great to see how this community has really held together and yeah. stood by each other and pulled through. I mean, this is my second pandemic launch. And that, yeah. that's, oh. that's really crazy. That's, we, we just never thought that would happen. So I'm so thrilled to see you here tonight. Congratulations on this amazing. Oh, thank you. You know, it's funny because like the, we have such a strong community, but I heard of you long before we met. Um, you were this enigma, Hank Philippi Ryan, Hank Philippi Ryan, right? And I, I want to say that I first met you at About Your Con. I want to say it was Toronto. And I saw you at the, um, at the St. Martin's party. And you looked fabulous. And I was very intimidated to say hello. And I remember, I can't remember a lot of, of what was happening that night, but I remember your outfit. <laughs> you were wearing this fitted black leather suit. It was like a jacket with a knee length skirt and these killer heels. And I thought, that's Hank Philippi Ryan. Oh. And I'm like, I'm gonna just, okay, I'm just gonna go up and I'm gonna say hello and I'm gonna introduce myself. And I bothered you because you were like surrounded by people and right as things were, yeah, I got my opening and I went in there and I introduced myself and you were so gracious and welcoming and you asked me about my books and I just thought, well, you know, everything I've heard about this amazing woman is true. And so when we talk about community, I want to say that you are really kind of the glue for so many of us, right? Like you connected so many people and, and all that being said, you are a fantastic writer. Um, your books are so twisty and amazing and fast. I love reading them. Jen, you know, I <laughs> my mascara is going to course down my face at this point. Thank you. And I and I love how what a sweet memory that is that you have. That's very nice. And I would love to have a different point of view on that. And probably say what really happened. Um, but I but I will just embrace that lovely thought. Thank you. I want to know if you still have the suit because that was a killer, <laughs> was a killer suit. You know, we, I looked at my shoes the other day and they're all just mm -hmm. lined up crying in my closet. You know, are you wearing your heels right now? Like, do you have any? any... Sure. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, ha I definitely oh, yeah. have them on. They look like flip flops, but they're actually, they're theoretical heels. <laughs> You know, it's funny, Jen, because I actually thought about wearing heels. I, I thought I'm going to, I did though, put on perfume. And then I mm. thought, why, why are you doing this? You know, no. Because of it, it's a feeling, right? It makes you feel, I don't know. It makes you feel like you're going somewhere, you know, which shows. But I want to talk to you about, um, about your books because we both write very similarly. I think we both write twisty psychological thrillers. 
that involve family relationships. And I want to know what inspires you to go there, because I know that for me, some of it is dissecting stuff that happened in my childhood, but then making it fictional. Um, so for me, it can be kind of personal, but is does it come from a personal space for you? Well, uh, in a way, I think all those things do. We all have relationships with our family and our parents and our sisters, especially even and daughters. And um, I know Joe does this too, and Hannah too. Our stories are about um, big themes or big corporations or a big sinister plot. But at the center of those are always real people. It's the story is really about the people involved, the families involved, the relationships involved. Because what there's nothing sweeter um, than a mother protecting a daughter or a father protecting a child or a, a relationship that's growing. And I think readers connect with that. Oh, yes, I feel that same way about my daughter. That's exactly what I would do. Or, you know, isn't little Rowan, the seven-year-old daughter in Lily's seven-year-old daughter who has a mysterious father, you know, does that harm her or help her? Or how does she deal with that? And she's only seven and what does she know? And Lily understands that her job is to help Rowan bloom into a wonderful person and a confident person who understands the world and cares about people. And how do you do that? And I think when you, you know, like as in Little Secrets, I mean, there is a child who has a terrible, it's all fine, terrible thing happen, but something that could happen, that they are whisked away. And this is page one. Um, yeah. in a situation that every parent has been in. And then that franticness that you bring to your main character in looking for her child, that's what connects readers, I think, to the books, that they that they connect right. with the real people with real emotions, just the same emotions that we all have. Don't you think? Isn't that? I do. And I, and I like what you said about how the stories are big, um, but the relationships are intimate, yes. you know? And it, when you're reading a book and, and there's that intimacy, I mean, everyone has family or people they consider family. Um, and so we can all relate to the dynamics and, um, and the love and the fear that we have. Nothing is scarier than something happening to someone you care about. Yeah. So I think it just, you do such a, a good job of, of making it a big concept book, but then dialing it down to all of the emotions that the people actually feel. Thank you. That's how I feel. That's how I feel about your book. Oh, thank well. you. <laughs> you have, what, so what are you working on? Oh, I've been writing this book for a million years. I bitch to Hannah all the time because she is my closest friend geographically. So she gets the brunt of all of my uh, angst. Um, I have a new book coming out in July. It was supposed to be winter, but I wasn't nearly finished. So <laughs> another pandemic. psychological thriller. I know my brain is not, it's taken a, a twice the effort to write the same length novel. So um, I'll be glad when it's done. Well, all your myriad fans are waiting for it. So no pressure. <laughs> But we all thank you. Exactly. Thank you. And congratulations. It's so I'm so glad to be here celebrating with you. Congratulations. And don't forget to put your name and city in the chat because we're giving away a copy of Jennifer Hillier's amazing little secret. So do that. Jenny, thank you. It's so great to see you tonight. This is such a party. I have to say too that while you guys are having this conversation about bringing like big situations down to emotions, there's a heated conversation going on in the chat about Hank's heels. Very equally important. I mean, the leather suit, yes, yeah, people are like, Hank's superpower is wearing heels. And I would like to know while I'm bringing our next guest on, like, what is your favorite pair of heels? Oh, we could talk for hours. About <laughs> All right, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and wouldn't that be so fascinating? Yes. Um, but I, I did see someone saying that um, who, Jim Latoile is here and Clea Simon and Elizabeth Elo and Anissa Armstrong and Allie. Thank you for the necklace, Allie. You're amazing. Um, and Gail. Oh, my gosh. And Elisa Ferstadt. Uh, wow. You all. Thank you. We can talk about shoes another time. I all right, fine. Sorry, I should never throw the shoe cherry bomb into the conversation because you're right. We could talk about it a lot. I think Joe probably also has a lot to say about shoes. Yeah. Like, yeah, right. That's, That's one of the first things we talked about. I, I, I thought that might be the case. So I wanted to give him a chance to talk about shoes. But instead, I'm going to invite Samantha Downing to the party. Samantha Downing, come on down. Yes. Turn your camera on, please. Hello. 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 Welcome. <laughs> all the way from New Orleans. We yes. Have are you okay? I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you for asking. Yes, everything is good here. Hi, everybody. Congratulations, Hank. 
Thank you. I want Jenna to read your bio, though, because I want okay. everybody to hear your wonderful history. Thank you. Although it is a short bio that doesn't do you justice. However, for those of you who don't yet know Smith Downing, uh, also you've been under a rock. Smith Downing is best-selling author of My Lovely Wife, and he started it. Her latest thriller, For Your Own Good, has been optioned by Robert Downey Jr. and Greg Berlanti for HBO Max, which is so exciting. I would like to know about that, but it's Hank's night, so I suppose I should let you guys have the conversation. I'll just be quiet. No, tell us about tell us about this. This this will be the best show. This will be amazing. It is so cinematic and so dark and so sinister. And I don't know how you write about such gruesome things. And then I'm just laughing throughout. <laughs> Thank you. True? Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope to watch it one day myself. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> so when they called you, what did they say? They um uh, my film agent and. LA called and said they were interested and wanted to talk about it and then they ended up optioning it so we'll see what happens. You and, uh, you Joe, know. you and Joe can talk afterward because Joe knows the scoop his two of his books have been made into major motion pictures and so you guys can have the Hollywood it's, it's amazing that's amazing I mean you just I think a lot of things get optioned and they have to choose which ones actually they put into production and make and that's that's just on them. There's just nothing we can do. It's, you know, the, and it's a long process, the same way publishing is a long process to get a book published. So but we'll I think, see. You know, I can I, hope, though. So. But heard we, we are here to talk about you, Hank. So congratulations. I read this book months ago, an early copy that you so graciously sent to me. And I've been talking about it ever since. And one thing I have thought about and wanted to ask you is that since the main character is in the media spotlight, do you put any of yourself into that character or do you make a concerted effort to not put any of yourself into that character? Well, that's really interesting because I, you know, I've been a reporter for a long time and I've, you know, wired myself with hidden cameras and confronted corrupt politicians and gone undercover and in disguise and had people come up to me at the grocery and I've had people yell at me and stalk me and follow me and give, you know, nasty phone calls and threaten me with lawsuits. So it'd be silly not to put that in. It'd be silly not to put that, not only the experience, but the emotional experience you know, the, how tough that is to deal with and what a juggle it is. And, you know, I had a, I had a um, executive producer once who said a good, a good investigative reporter comes to town and stays till everyone hates them. So, and, and so, so kind of my job is to do that. So yes, I mean, that is what happens to Lily. She knows that she relies on she relies on whistleblowers, on tipsters, on sources to tell her stories because she can't to give her to give her insight into stories, to point her in the right direction of where she needs to research stories. So she is required to trust someone that she doesn't know. Now, she's not going to put a story on TV without doing super research. And everybody knows that that's what a real reporter does. But she needs to trust that someone is sending her in the right direction. And I understand that fully. Um, and so I think, I mean, people have said, and I try to make my stories be, feel authentic. You know, what Lily does is what a reporter would really do. How Lily feels is how a reporter, a good reporter, uh, an honorable reporter would really feel. So I feel really lucky to have had, you know, somebody says, do you do, somebody asked me once if I did a lot of research for my books. And I'm like, I've been researching for 40 years. You know, I just didn't know it. I just didn't know it. So sure, she. what happened to Lily has not happened to me. It's not my books, Lily's story is not my life made into fiction in any way. She's completely different. She has a seven-year-old daughter. Um, she's younger than I am. She's more famous than I am. There's all kinds of things that are that are different, but it's the essence of the spotlight. It's the essence of the juggle. It's the essence of the pressure that's always on you. You know, I can't, I can't, I can't ever make a mistake. Lily can't ever make a mistake. And that, that's a lot of pressure. And if you do, everyone sees it because you're on the air. Right? Yeah, <laughs> that must yeah, be a yeah, lot there. of pressure. Yeah, I mean, a hundred percent. And so I can't call someone by the wrong name or miscalculate or get a factor wrong. I can't be one second late, not one second late. Um, and I, and I have to look okay the whole time. 
you know, even if the fire is over here and the wind is blowing the other direction, you still have to look or the crazy person behind you is yelling or, or your light falls on you, as has happened in the past. You have to just behave as if everything is just fine. Which reminds me of my favorite story about you when I was doing an online thing for one of my books and you were not supposed to be online. It was supposed to be me talking and it was in your book club on Facebook and something went wrong technically and you had to jump on screen oh. to help. Like out of the blue had to jump on screen. She, you looked perfect. You looked absolutely <laughs> perfect. And I was yeah, thinking yeah. If, I had to, if I had to jump online with no... No forewarning, I would be like, <laughs> look at yeah, you looked good. absolutely perfect, camera ready at all times. So Thanks. it's it was amazing. Thank you. Yeah, and my last, my, my other question I want to ask about though is the cover because mm. the cover is so stunning on this book. Um, how did it that. come about, or how much input do you have into it, or did they just create it and you loved it, or how did it happen? Yeah, thank you, Jenna, for holding that up. This is the visual aid. This is the visual aid. Um, it's interesting because I, it started out, and you know this is Forge who does this, and Katie Klimowitz is the, is the cover designer, and she's a genius. And I'll tell you one secret about it. So I kept saying, I, I knew we, we knew we wanted a, a woman on the cover. We weren't quite sure who she was in the book, and so I'm not going to say who she is in the book. And I kept saying, I want the book to look like a jewel. I want it to look like a jewel, just an irresistible, gorgeous objet. And that I wanted her to be um, mysterious and a little sinister, a little Mona Lisa, a little elegant, a little, you know, hard to read. And up pops this JPEG with this in it. And I just went, oh, I just said, oh my golly, that is completely perfect. She's you know, there's a word that I can't come up with, but that you you she you can't perceive what you all help me with this. You know, what, what do they call the Mona Lisa? That she's some word that like um, unreachable, unreadable. It's sort of girl with the pearl earring looking mm -hmm. book, isn't it? And when you touch it, and because you are all going to touch it, because you need to have a copy of this. Just saying, no pressure. It's just my career. It's very soft. Everyone in the chat is saying enigmatic. 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 Thank you. Enigmatic. Yeah, it's so great to see it takes that. Takes a village. It takes a village to come up with her. <laughs> yes, enigmatic, and that is exactly um, what she is. And the secret of the cover was initially her eyes were blue, and I said to the cover designer Katie, "Can you make her eyes green?" And she says, "Okay, sure." And her eyes were green. So now you know the secret of the green eyes. And when you read the book, you'll find out why that's important. But thank you. Don't you love it? I, I love, love it. Love I think it. it's fantastic. And congratulations. The book is fantastic. Thanks. And thank you for having us all here. This is it's so kind. You are so kind. You are one of the kindest people I've met in in the book community. And you, it's just amazing how kind you are. Thank so you, thank Samantha. you very much. I hope one day we meet in person. Isn't that crazy? I feel as if I know you completely. And that is so nuts when I think about that. But I look at this group, look at this, this group. Um, and I love that the next person is someone who's new to book world. And wow, we are so happy to have her. And she is patient as there well. There she is. No she wonder. Come well. back. There you are. Yay. So Samantha. Crazy. Oh my gosh, yes. now our lineup is complete because we have Wanda Morris in the house. Welcome. Welcome to the party. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, there it is. Congratulations, Hank. Oh my golly. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you so much. And congratulations to you too. I know this, mm. you were telling us earlier that this took a while to happen, but Jenna, read the bio so we can hear all about it. I Wanda. would be so delighted. So Wanda is, is the newcomer at the party, both the Hank mm. party and the book party. And we are so excited to welcome her. I just love that you are here. So this is a slightly longer bio because like you are making this transition into author world, <laughs> author Landia. So welcome. So Wanda M. Morris is a corporate attorney who has worked in the legal departments for several Fortune 100 companies, an accomplished presenter and leader. Wanda has previously served as the president of the Georgia chapter of the Associate of the Corporate Council and is the founder of its Women's Initiative, which is an empowerment program for female in-house lawyers. Wanda is an alumna of the Yale Writers Workshop and Robert McKee Story Synagogue. 
seminar synagogue story <laughs> seminar, <laughs> synagogue you know it's a, it's all a holy thing yeah, yeah. she is a member of sisters in crime mystery writers of america and crime writers of color and you're married the mother of three and you live in atlanta and your new book coming out november 2nd is all her little secrets which you can all pre-order and did you know you can help an author so so much by pre-ordering everything you pre-order for months in advance all counts toward that author's first week of being out on the shelf so you can really boost an author's book by pre-ordering please I'll order at least 50 copies of this book right now. Oh, right now. Not right now, as Hannah and I say. Not right now, right now. But when this is over, <laughs> go pre-order pre the book. Wanda, welcome. And I want to say to you, Wanda, um, welcome to the book universe. And welcoming you in the comments is Tess Gerritsen. So um, no pressure, but Tess is here now. So thank you, Tess, for coming. It is lovely. Oh my gosh, thank you. I, I gotta, I gotta tell you first and foremost, I am like blown away by this lineup that you put together, and I am so humbled that you know you have taken me under your wing, Hank. You are an angel that walks among us, and I am so, so very grateful for everything you've done for me. And um, wow, just, Look, I you know, really I, my complete pleasure because a good book is a good book. You know, <laughs> it, it, I mean, Hannah is nodding. Hannah and I read it sort of at the same time and we're texting back and forth. Like, can you believe this? Can you believe how good this book is? This is really a good book. This is a wonderful book. Ooh, ooh we love this book. So congratulations yeah. on this. Um, it's somebody, what, is, what do people say? It's like the firm meets the other black girl. Yeah, I've I've heard those comparisons and uh, wow, <laughs> that's kind of mind blowing because I love both those books. Yeah, I do too. I do too. But thank you so much for inviting me and I love, love, loved your book. I, um, I read it in two sittings and the only reason why I didn't do it in one is because I have a 12 year old. And so I figured I needed to attend to my child at some point. Um, but when I picked it up, I read it straight through and I, I started, I was like, cause I like to read before I go to bed. Mm -hmm. And I picked it up around 8.30 figuring, yeah, I'll read a few chapters. I'll pick it up again over the, the next few nights. I was up until two o'clock in the morning. Oh, I'm sorry. I was like bleary eyed the next morning because you create this cat and mouse game that you cannot put it down. I kept saying, "What the heck is going to happen?" You are. Yeah, I did too. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm putting you a masterful on the next cover. Thank you. I'm just going to take down every little word you yeah. said. There yeah. you go. But one of the things I wanted to ask you is, um, I, I think our books are a little bit alike in that we both have protagonists who are kind of knee deep in office politics. They they go into these office settings, these workspaces where they have to put on these facades. Mm. And how did you how did you come up with this idea that you know? I need to have this woman, you know, be so perfect and do these things. How do you think that that translates to the reader? Does it make her more relatable? Does it make her standoffish because she is so perfect? What kind of was your thinking around that? Yeah, I think that's really an interesting question. And that's really one of the, that was one of the big challenges exactly of writing this book, because um, I remember now, um, this is going to date me like crazy, but I remember when I was in high school and I I still love Simon and Garfunkel, I still love Paul Simon, my favorite, but they, I love every Simon and Garfunkel song except for Homeward Bound. And I remember, you know, it's about the, the, the band on tour and all they want to do is go home and they're famous and they do these big um, concerts and then, but they're whining about how they just want to go home. And I thought, why, why are you whining about being, being a rock star? I don't want to hear about that. Um, and then I realized, you know, uh, in writing the book, that's one of the things that people don't like to hear about famous people whining about being famous. You know, it's like, get over yourself, you know, you're in the spotlight. And so it was a little bit of a tightrope to walk. And that's why I wanted you to know Lily and know Lily's daughter and know Lily's history a little bit and know that she was, she is an honorable, determined, hardworking 
person. And that, this perception of perfection comes from outside. It mm -hmm. comes from, for instance, what Greer says about her. Her producer, Greer, describes her as being a little standoffish, you know, a little um, snobby, but that's not true. And my goal with Greer and writing the Greer character was to have her be like the vox pop, the, the, the people who are talking about the person on the air and realizing that they are wrong about her. They have decided what she's like and they're wrong. And the people who have decided that she's perfect are wrong too. But again, she has to look good on the air. So that was a, that's a big juggle. That's a big juggle. You put your finger on it so well because writing about fame and celebrity is uh, dangerous territory. So I yeah, wanted it, that is a that is a, a good way to describe it because you know, like in my book, you you have this woman who you know has this you know high powered job and she makes all this money and it's like, well, you know, what is she complaining about? Exactly. So exactly. you know, you're you're trying to make her you know human, um, but she still is who she is. Exactly. Um, I mean, we all have, I mean, your main character has a brother that she cares about mm -hmm. um, and, she, and she is treading on dangerous territory as well. And that's what we were all talking about earlier, too, is that we see Lily in her family. We see Lily think about her sister. We see, see Lily think about her parents and her daughter and her daughter's life. And no matter what job we have, we care about our family. And again, that was the other, that was the other essence of the story is to have it be about who Lily really is behind those lights, behind the spotlight, behind the performer, who she really is. And I, one of the things I hoped about this book is to have uh, people watch TV in a little bit of a different kind of way to see the people on the air as, as, different, as different people. Oh, that's really interesting. Well, you are a supreme master. I oh, love good. this book. Well, love somebody said, so thank you, Don. Thank you. Really high praise. And somebody in the chat is really, really lucky. People are saying, oh, I can't wait for this book. I can't wait for this book. Hi, Wanda, you're a new author to me. Hi, from Wanda from Oklahoma. Erin is saying, Wanda, I'm so looking forward to this debut. So hooray. I hope we introduced you tonight to a lot of new fans. Thank you so much. Thank you again for everything. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. So I've noticed a lot of people saying also, like, this author is new to me and that author is new to me and my TBR mountain, somebody called it in the, in the chat, is growing and growing. So now everybody has the view from TBR mountain. Um, and we also have this fantastic mountain of questions. We have 30 questions. <laughs> you to email so me, email me. Yes. We might not be able to get to all those questions, but the chat is actually a recorded chat. So I'm hoping that all of you, if you have a chance, go back and answer some of the questions because readers really want to know like the answers to all of these things. I'm going to sort of- Let me just interrupt, let me just interrupt and say, Tara Laskowski, yay, whose new book is fabulous also, says, yay, Wanda, Wanda's book is one of my favorites I've read this year, so good. And Dana Isaacson is here and Tom Lyons, hello, is saying Joe Finder's books are amazing. So everybody read the chat, you all. You all read the chat because you need to, there's a lot of love coming through that chat for you all. Thanks. It's like a Goodreads love fest, this chat. It's just like, you know, reviews of everybody's books and everybody loves all the books and here's what they love about the books and also your heels, Hank. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's that's, important. that's joy. important. It's a joy to see. So I'm going to be like the bad person here and just kind of throw blindfolded darts at the questions because there's okay. no way we can get to all of the questions, but I'm going to pick some. Um, and I will pick some that um, I think everybody can answer, yeah, Hank, if you're great. inclined to um, share your mic. Um, but they seem to pertain to all the authors we have with us. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take the last one first from Pamela Ross, who says, what a wonderful and lovely event, a delight to be here. Question for Hank, were you an avid Nancy Drew fan <laughs> as a child? Is that where your love for mysteries began or was there another trigger that launched your perfect career? We see what you did there, Pamela. We see what you did there, Pamela. Um, of course, I read Nancy Drew. I grew up in really rural Indiana and you know this, I would go, my sister and I would ride our ponies to the library and take out books from the library and read up in the hayloft of the barn behind our house. And so I did start with Nancy Drew, but my true beginning in mystery was Sherlock Holmes. I really learned a lot from Conan Doyle's stories about characterization and plotting and mystery and clues and surprises. And then I remember reading Murder on the Orient Express and I was about 12 and I thought, 
wait a minute, how did Agatha Christie do that? How did she do that? And I decided that if I were, ever were a writer, I would want to write those twisty, surprising stories like that. So I decided though it might be cooler to be, to be Sherlock Holmes than to write about Sherlock Holmes. So for all those years, I was a, I'm a reporter, which is sort of being a detective and then switched to, to being, to writing about detectives and crime fiction. So kind of a little double life, but yeah, Nancy Drew was the start, but Sherlock Holmes and Agatha Christie and all the golden age authors, Niall Marsh and Josephine Tay and Marjorie Ellingham, Dorothy Sayers. I read all of those and loved them um, as well. Did you all read Nancy Drew? What was your all, what was your starter mystery? I, I, I... I've read them before, but I was reading stuff that was far, far, far above my age requirement. I mean, I was slipping into my mom's, you know, bedroom and reading Valley of the Dolls. Sure. And like that. <laughs> so when I was like 12, so. Didn't yeah. we all? Of course. Right. I remember sneaking Marjorie Morningstar from my mom's <laughs> bookshelf, right? Because I thought, ooh, this is going to be good, but and it was. People are very excited about that. Dally of the Dallas, Erica John traumatized yeah. me for years yep. and years. I thought I had to look like that cover, never look like the cover. Yeah. <laughs> um, so here's a process question that's for you, Hank, and also for everybody. I think if you get to a part of your story and you get stuck, this is from Sharon Person. Hello, Sharon. What clears your head so you could keep going? A walk, a nap, shopping, etc. Shopping, what is this that you speak of? <laughs> um, you know, when I get stuck, and I, you know, I have a deadline. And so I need to finish my book, just like I do as a reporter. You know, if I can't, if I said to my, my news director, can I be on the six o'clock news at 10 after six? You know, cause I'm not really feeling it. You know, that wouldn't really work so well. So I know I have to write this book. And what I say to myself, if I don't know what's coming next, I don't call it writer's block. Cause I don't really believe in that knock on wood. I think it's just fear when you don't know what's happening. And I say to myself, what would someone really do? What does this character really want right now? What is this for? What is, what is he or she doing now? Why are they doing this? And then I think, oh, okay, that, that's, that's what, and then that's what happens. And someone is forced to make a decision. And when they make a decision, that reveals their character, right? Do they do the good thing or the bad thing? And then that decision propels them into action. And then the story takes off, one can only hope. But that's, that's what I say to myself. What does that person want? Do you guys have process answers? Hank, do you want to do you want to sort of pass the mic around about like what gets people unstuck? Into yeah, what gets you unstuck? That? Anybody have a secret? I'm asking for a friend here. Yeah, I skip ahead. Oh, mm. because I plot. So nobody ever said that the book has to be written in 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 the order that it is read in. So if I um, the book I'm writing now, I know there's one chapter I need to do research on but I don't know if it's actually gonna make the cut. So I just wrote, do research, <laughs> ask Bruce Robert Coffin, cause he's my go-to guy, love Bruce. And I just did, you know, um, insert page break, next chapter, move on. And I'll oh, go I back, Phil. <laughs> well, I could never do that. Jenny, what about you? I sleep, you know, usually when the brain just starts to die, that's when I know I need to call it a day and go to sleep. And almost always when I wake up, I figure out the thing that was the obstacle. Um, I think if I'm thinking about it too hard, it doesn't come. That's I, so this is good for naps. Anybody else take naps? <laughs> I take I take naps or I take a shower. Oh, one of the two will will work for it depends on what the problem is. If it's a, if it's a plot point, shower or nap, if there's a bigger problem with the book or if I'm not feeling the book. I will throw the book out. I know you've done that. I can't believe you actually have thrown. Yeah, I just, I just threw one out. I have Can to I start have all it? over. So. I feel you. I did that with this book at 35,000 words. It was awful. <laughs> I don't recommend it. No. Do you feel good about that or do you feel sad? And also, can I have that one too? I could probably- I feel it. good about it. I, I wrote the whole book. I made my deadline. I gave it to my editor. And then I said, but you know what? I don't like this book and I want to throw it out. What did they and, say? Okay. Oh, the, the stillness falls over the crowd. <laughs> I, said, oh. I said I would be embarrassed if this book came out. 
And they said, okay, then it's not, then it can't come out. Wow. Wow. What do you think about that, Joe? Oh, you're mm -hmm. muted. No, I'm unmuted, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I have thrown out chunks of books, um, but usually by the time I start writing, I've sort of figured out the shape of the book. Mm. And so it's, it's rare for me to actually write 30,000 words and decide they're no good. I've usually I've sort of figured out enough pieces of the book that the worst I do is sort of rewrite the opening, you know, come up with a different, different intro. Um, and I also take naps, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I think. And in fact, when I have a real plot problem, I will sort of read my notes right before I go to sleep. And I go to sleep and I wake up in the morning and usually my brain has solved that problem. So it's sort of like, a, it's like you put it in the slow cooker overnight, you know, yeah. and it works. Wow, that's fascinating. I'm all about taking naps and sleeping now. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> I love this advice. Tess Garrison says, I'm glad you're emphasizing how hard it is. It is tough. It's hard. No question. We all know that. And it, and it doesn't get easier after more books. Sorry, Wanda. Oh, lovely. Um, <laughs> don't scare her. Lovely. <laughs> no, great. You have to be better and better and better. You know, your mm -hmm. story has to be new and unique and riveting and great. Um, I agree. And she says it gets harder. And I think that is so true. Agreed. It gets yeah. harder. Oh, Every book but, is harder. But you know, you've done it. That's what, when I'm having a, a, a beep, terrible day. I um, remind myself, you've done this before. Yes. You've been yeah. here before. You've, and my husband reminds me of that frequently. About this time every year, I say, this is the worst thing I've ever written. And he laughs. <laughs> and he says, you said that last year. And it was fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so right. no sympathy. And it's true. I say exactly the same thing to Jonathan. And then I say, but my next line is, but this might be the time that I'm really right. And it really is bad. <laughs> and then he says, you always say that too. So... <laughs> Good to have that. Oh gosh. We have Jonathan. There is a question. There it is from Mary Zayner, whose name I hope I'm saying right. Will you ever create a character based on Jonathan? Which I thought was a hilarious. That's story. adorable. My darling husband Jonathan, um, who is a criminal defense attorney and a civil rights attorney, and just the best guy. Um, and every character has a little bit of Jonathan in it. Don't don't tell him that. There is a character, there is a character in my book, Truth Be Told, a, a lawyer called Peter Hardesty, who is kind of, kind of Jonathan. And I honestly get fan mail for Peter Hardesty. Like, when are you going to put Peter back in a book? So that must mean something. Thank you, Mary. That's a great question. Jonathan told you to ask that, didn't he? <laughs> I like Peter to do Peter to do it. Um, okay, so a question that again, like all of you can answer. I'm gonna smash some questions together into a pandemic question um, that comes from two different people. Um, and one of it was a twofold question, which is um, what was the hardest thing about the pandemic and what was the positive thing that happened during the pandemic? And then um, are you going out on the road again? So that's from Deborah Proust. And I'm sorry, Deborah, I was sort of paraphrasing while I was looking for the question. Um, and then also from, sorry, sorry, cannot read fast enough, um, Nancy Bland, who is asking about how soon hey, you Nancy, how are you get out and meet people. So I would love to hear you talk about pandemic-ness as yeah. an author. Samantha, go ahead. Um, the hardest thing was writing. That's everything I threw out. <laughs> and the um, best thing, um, I bought an exercise bike and I'm very excited about it. And that's, it's my, it was my best purchase ever during the pandemic. So that was great. That's and great. Um, I will be doing an uh, in-person event here in New Orleans in October. I don't know what the future will hold. That's the only, at, a, at a, one of our local bookstores. Jennifer, what about you? Just go, I'm just going in the order you are on my screen. So just go ahead and take the start. I, I think the biggest challenge was not being alone, right? Like we have this very small house and my husband was working from home for the first time and I could hear him breathing in the next room and it was making me kind of stabby um, and not in a good way, not in a creative way. But I think the, the bonus um, 
was that it kind of lessened my obligations. Uh, Mm. You know, it kind of um, minimized the amount of stuff that I had to do outside of the home. And that was kind of nice too. Oh, that's interesting. Hannah? And so let me just say, go back to your stabby feeling about your husband. (laughs) (laughs) That just went right by. He's just just always there, you know? And then I would get up and go to the kitchen and he's there too. And and then I'm in my scene and I can hear the toilet flush and I'm supposed to be home alone. So, it, it, you know, I had to adjust to that, which is probably why the book took so long, because I was thinking about the wrong person. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Samantha bought an exercise bike. Maybe we need to get you some headphones. Noise. Yeah. <laughs> and everything turned out fine, though, right? And Everything's he's, he's still alive. Yeah, he's still he's good. He's healthy. We'll check in from time to time. <laughs> Hannah? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um... The worst thing, um, my mum passed last year and I couldn't get to Switzerland to to be with her. So that was the absolute crappiest thing. Um, But at the same time, weirdly, it made writing easy because the book that I was that I started about a month after she passed um, was the I'm not going to call it easy, that's wrong, was the smoothest writing experience I've ever had. And I think it was because it was the only place I could control what was going on. So I could go in there and wreak havoc, um, and but control everything in a, in a controlled environment that I had all of the power over. Um, but the best thing that came out of the pandemic was First Chapter Fun. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that that would not have happened if if we hadn't gone into into lockdown I just don't I just don't think it would have happened and and our friendship that has come out of that and meeting all connecting with so many authors you know it's just been it's truly been wonderful yeah I agree about first chapter fun yeah it was um tender for me to go through the situation with you and your dear mom yeah no I know that was hard and um we were all with you and that and you can please read the please read the um comments or the is the word I'm searching for so unsuccessfully about that and people really love you and got to meet you uh, through first chapter fun in the pandemic so yeah Joe what about you about the pandemic um I found that I really miss the author events that I normally do you know book fairs and festivals and that kind of thing where you get to meet readers and you get to meet other writers you know, that's, that's one of the great things about touring or just in general about being a writer. And those events are not happening. Yeah. So well, we I'm do miss that. each other. Did it affect your writing at all? Um, I think it did. Yeah, I think so. I, I um, Hard to say how, but um, yeah. It's hard not to. I mean, there is this sort of to, yeah. terror around you. You don't if you go outside that you could die. That's just not. It's it's terrifying. Right. So it it has to change. Right. Yeah. I know. I was I was on book tour when when everything started to lock down March the tw- March the twelfth, twenty twenty. I was in the Palm Beach airport, and I just so eager to get home. And there was a woman in the airport who had a mask on, and she took off the mask, she pulled down the mask and sneezed and then put the mask back on. And I thought, <laughs> get me out of here. You know, this is person not clear on the concept. And it was, I couldn't, I usually write on airplanes, really good at writing on airplanes. And I, I just couldn't do it. I just sat and stared at the screen because it was just so unsettling. Wanda, did you, you were in the midst of writing your first book during this. Well, no, I had finished um, uh, the first book. Um, and I started working on the second book. So, um, it, it, you know, it was good and bad for me. It was, it was good in that um, Zoom made a lot more authors ex- accessible to me. Um, mm-hmm. And so I could attend other people's events and, um, you know, what I was lacking in that in-person, I still got the benefit of through, through Zoom. Um, but you know, that's a a double-edged sword because what I got through Zoom, I was 
severely missing in person. I have a couple writer friends here that I would get together with for coffee and we'd have writing sprints and we couldn't do that anymore. And I miss that. And, you know, for a little while, you know, it kind of affected gosh, can I go and write a second book? But that's a whole nother, you know, Zoom call to talk yeah. about writing. That's a whole nother Zoom call. That's, <laughs> year we're all doing this. We're all doing this in person together. We're going to bring the band back together to Brookline next fall in real life. And we can all be in the booksmith together. I don't know how we're going to do that, but we will figure that out somehow. I mean, you, you have to be a little bit optimistic. You do, we just have to. Um, writing a book requires such optimism, you know, to, to write, to type chapter one and then think, okay, 100,000 words to go, not a problem. Um, right. So I, my heart goes out to all of you for, and I mean, you and all of you, um, I'm looking at the chat here of persevering through this time. And it's just been a joy <laughs> to be able to, I mean, talk about the best thing about the pandemic, this crazy, ridiculous, terrifying pandemic, is that all of you are here. I mean, imagine that would never, ever have happened without this. And this is just a night that I treasure. It's, I think I, the pandemic I, as well as has changed things for all of us um, with regards to online events. I'd done online events before, but never to the extent that we were almost forced to do, um, particularly when we had books coming out last year and this year. And I think that hopefully, I'm hoping that that has changed um, publishers and, and also to a certain extent bookshops views about them as well, because there are many people who cannot come out to a yes. live event mm -hmm. because of physical disabilities or transportation or geography. Um, and so one of the questions, Jenny, you asked was, what about a return to in-person events? I definitely want to go back to those, but I certainly want to keep online um, for sure moving forward. And I'm looking at the at the chat here and there and Amanda is here from Canada and Priya from Texas and people from and Anissa is here and people from all over the country are here. And that just that just couldn't possibly have happened um, without the pandemic. Oh, it's a, it's a trade-off, but I um, my heart is open to that, and we have to be optimistic about it. Look at the bright side. Yep. There's a beautiful um, uh, comment from Jennifer Erickson, a lot of beautiful comments, and she said, quarantine may have confined me to my house, but the pandemic has expanded my world. And I feel exactly the same way that summed up so beautifully. Thank oh, you yes. for that and for all of your comments. I think we have time for one more question. We've gone a half hour over time, which is okay. it would happen with such effervescent company. Um, but I will ask a question that maybe you could do a lightning round and then Hank, if you would finish, um, people always want to know what is next. And for Hank in particular, would you ever return to a series or are you working on a standalone? So I give this to the group and to Hank to finish up. Okay, so Joe, go ahead. What, next book? Yeah, what are you, what are you working on? Everybody's well, asking. Uh, I'm working on a book um, about a female um, psychiatrist in Boston with a very big dark secret hmm. and her involvement, her possible involvement in a homicide. Great. We can't wait. Is there any timing on that? No, no, yet. Next year. All right. Samantha, we know what your, so what is, your book is coming out. What happened about that? Um, I don't think I'll be having a book coming out in 2022. I think the next one's in 2023, but I don't know for sure. I don't have a solid date. So now I'm now writing book four. And also you will, will be able to see the movie possibly or the series. <laughs> of Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> That'll be, that'll, that's going to take up a lot of your time. And when your new book finally does come out, we will all know the origin story of what happened to the book that didn't happen. Yes. <sighs> Jennifer, what about you? You're working too, you said. Yeah, I'm working on edits right now that have been going on for a million years. Um, and it's my first book that's set in Toronto partially. And it's 90s and it uh, takes place partly in a strip club. So I was um, tapping into some of the high school friends <laughs> that I know who went into stripping after high school. Um, and uh, it's been really fun. It's been, it's a fun book to write if I could just finish. You will, you will, you've done it before, you'll do it again. And Hannah, you have actually a book coming out with an actual date. I do, May 24th, I learned. 
for an honest man that's that's supposed to be the title as far as I know which is a fantastic book by the way oh, fantastic thank you. amazing thank you, thank you. Um, yeah it was a, it was a fun one it's uh, the first one I've written from from the the anti-hero's point of view um, and he is he is a lovely guy to hang out with if you can disregard the fact that he hired a hitman on the dark web to kill his very rich but annoying wife aside from that he's a great guy it was fun I mean, so the book the book is fantastic it is diabolical and so hannah mary mckinnon funny too i laughed out loud very and, funny yeah. and wanda can you give us the scoop on your book i think i can um uh it takes place in 1964 mississippi where two uh black women sisters become embroiled in the murder of a white man and they both take off running. But what they don't realize is that somebody knows what they've done back in Mississippi. And that person is hot on their trail with not good intentions. So you were all just listening to you like <laughs> And I think, and Dana Isaacson says, uh, Hannah, that your character sounds like Klaus von Bülow. <laughs> <laughs> So that is kind of perfect. And I'm working on a book um, which is due in a month. It will be done in a month. Um, tentatively, it's about um, a woman who is in the midst of a divorce. Uh, she is. She thought she was happily married and then she wasn't. And now she has to decide what to do. She feels very alone. Um, and then she meets a new friend. And as she'll say, money changes everything. That's what friends are for. So it's called her new best friend. And we'll see what happens with that. As I said, I don't have any idea what's gonna happen in the end of it. So we'll see. That's what makes it suspenseful, right? You don't know. You have no yeah. idea what's gonna happen. Oh my gosh, so much love for all of you, for all of the books that exist, for all the books that are coming out. Everybody is so excited. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And I wish I could have asked, all of the questions we would be here at least until tomorrow and Hank would miss her official launch day. Uh, no, is... that, so it's good. Um, so um, I would love to invite Booksmith to come back and um, close us out. And this has just been such a joy and a privilege to be with all of you. Amazing writers. Thank you. Hank. Oh my gosh. This has been such a delight um, to sit in on. I just want to say thank you everybody who's in the audience. Um, for making this one of our biggest, bestest events of the fall. Um, and congratulations so much to Hank on this wonderful new book. Um, we can't wait for you to come in and sign. And thanks to Hannah Mary and Joe and Jennifer and Wanda and Samantha. And last but not least, Jenna for being a wonderful, wonderful MC. So thank you. All. Oh, yes. And stay tuned on stay our tuned. website to find out more about Woodrow on the Bench. I'm going to um, tell you very, very quickly, and I, I'm going to just going to put myself right out here. This is Jenna Blum's new book, Woodrow on the Bench. It comes out in October. Um, please look for this book. Please pre-order this book. Please, it comes with its own little pack of Kleenex because <laughs> it is life-changingly, tenderly wonderful um, about Jenna's relationship with her gorgeous dog life lessons from a wise old dog and truly you do not want to miss this book it is a treasure it is a treasure congratulations jenna on this thoughtful joyful loving sweet beautiful book and we will talk about this more <laughs> thank you oh my god and wanda i will see you out there we will be promoting at the same time so we will be online it will be a joy and i will see all of you online everywhere and don't forget you guys you can get <laughs> Nice copies of this book. Uh, but let me just say in closing, really though, Alex, that um, it has been an astonishing experience to be with you here tonight. When I started writing in the pandemic, you know, I realized it's always safe inside a book, always safe inside a book. And that's what we're all here to bring you a little bit of safety and a little bit of joy and a little bit of escape and a little bit of being in someone else's problem and not our own. Um, this is what we do and this is what we love and to see all of you here tonight to share this with us has just been, I mean, again, I'm going to click leave and then I'm going to burst into tears. So <laughs> I thank you all more than I can ever even describe 
I want to thank, please let me thank Forge, my publisher, my darling uh, editor, Kristen Sevick and Alexis Serala at Forge, and my agent, Lisa Gallagher, and Brookline Booksmith. Thank you so much for making this happen. Joe and Samantha and Jennifer and Hannah and Wanda and Jenna, thank you. Um, this has been a life-changing evening, and thank you to all of you um, who came here tonight to share this with us. Thank you so much, Hank. Thank and you. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful night. Congratulations. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.